man. Thank you, guys. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. Thank you, Pastor Matt, uh, for those gracious words and for giving me the opportunity to share this morning. Um, so, yeah, I'm a father, so I guess I'm qualified to speak this morning. I'm not, not, not real sure about that yet. Not sure how good I'm doing as a father. Um, but anyways, hey, before we get started, I uh, just want to remind you, uh, as you go about your week, uh, this, this week, uh, our students, our Rise Up Youth, uh, will be going to camp, leaving tomorrow uh, morning to head to Gastonia for Crowder's Camps. There's uh, 36 students and six leaders that will be going to camp. So just uh, remember those students and those leaders uh, in your prayers this week. Also, uh, 10 days from now, 10 days from today, is the deadline for our early bird uh, Thrive Marriage Conference, right? So right now you can you can register for our Thrive Marriage Conference September 17th and September 18th for $50 per couple. Uh, that price will go up in 10 days at the end of the month. So make sure uh, that you do that today. Don't, don't wait any longer on that. Hey, so happy Father's Day to all the dads out here, all the dads, the, the stepdads, the uncles, the grandfathers, everybody that is uh, playing that role of a father, and I know uh, anytime we celebrate uh, something, it could be an opportunity for others to kind of be uh, grieving a day. And you know, there as we celebrate our dads that are here today, there there are some that are you know grieving the loss of their father today and and unable to celebrate that with him. Um, so uh, I just want to let you know that we uh, we remember you and um, we love you and we are thinking about you um, today. But I can't go any further without wishing my own dad a very special Happy Father's Day. I've got a picture of my dad. This is my dad right here. This is Harry M. Hatcher the Third. Um, I am Harry Hatcher the Fourth. Um, growing up, I was always called Little Harry, and I hated that name. I didn't share that with the first service. I don't know why I shared it with you guys. Um, so don't tell anybody that. Don't don't call me that, um, or I. have may get violent. Um, but uh, so yeah, so that's my dad. Now my dad uh, owned and operated a restaurant for almost 40 years. Um, he, he had a restaurant in our community and, um, and naturally as you know, I, I was getting older, I, I spent a lot of time at the restaurant. I spent a lot of time, um, you know, going to catering events and, and helping out. And then uh, when I got around 13 or 14, I started uh, working a, a little, you know, better there and instead of just being in the way. Uh, but my dad would, uh, the older I got, he would teach me um, things. And one of my dad's most favorite things to say was he'd be like, son, this is a life lesson. This is a life lesson, son. Pay attention to this. And uh, I didn't really care so much about it. Uh, when it was going on, I was like, mm, that's great. How many uh, ribeyes do you want me to cut for this party that we have tomorrow night? And, uh, but he was always telling me these life lessons. And one of, the, one, of the most, uh, one of the most favorite, I guess it stands out to me the most, is my dad would say, um, he would say, let your eyes be your guide. Let your eyes be your guide. And he would say, your eyes are going to tell you everything that you need to know. As the older I got and I began taking on a managerial role in the restaurant, he would say, your eyes are going to tell you everything that you need to know about this business. And he would say, you see that ceiling tile there? It's a little discolored. That means that we have an AC leak or there's a, a leak in the roof. And do you see this uh, customer? They're kind of looking around, kind of lost, like they don't know where to go or what to do. They need some help. Or if you see a cup on the table that's only ice, that's somebody needs a refill there. Um, so he would tell me all these things. He said, just pay attention. Your eyes will be your guide, and they're going to tell you everything that you need to, to know. And if he said, you do that, you'll be successful. Um, so naturally, uh, you know, now that I'm a father, uh, I have these uh, life lessons that I feel is my duty to share with my children and, and to teach them and to, to show them things and to guide them. And uh, what I'm learning is that I, I think that I'm teaching them and showing them things, but in reality, uh, they're teaching me. And they're teaching me about my relationship with God and how God looks at me. And I have some great teachers. I got a picture of my two teachers right here on your right 
is our oldest. That is Aniston Grace. And on the left is Parker Faith. Aniston is seven years old and Parker is three years old. And um, class for them is always in session. Um, you don't get dismissed. Uh, there's never a spring break or a summer break or anything like that. There's no early release days. Um, it, class is always, that bell never rings. Class is always going on. Um, but they are teaching me a lot uh, about life and teaching me a lot about God. Um, some things that I needed to learn. And so uh, you may be saying, well, that's, that's cool. I'm not, a, I'm not a dad or I'm not a parent. I'm, you know, don't have children or my kids are grown. But listen, no matter what you are, no matter who you are, uh, I believe God has something for every one of us today. No matter what, uh, God is going to teach us something today. And that's actually what we're calling this me message today is no matter what. Um, no matter what. And so uh, one of the first things that I've learned from my children are that no matter what, um, my kids aren't going to listen, right? No matter what, my kids aren't going to listen all the time, every time. Uh, it doesn't matter how hard that we try, no matter what behavior we have modeled, no matter how many times that we have said, you better be listening, or when I'm, one of the things I like to say to my kids, like, when I'm talking, you're listening, that, and it didn't, it didn't ever, never works. They're like, whatever. Um, you know, but I'm like, Hey, you need to listen, pay attention to this. And, and they don't listen. And then we even try that little, you know, that little thing that the, you know, it's, is anybody's kids, you know, they're like, they listen for other people, but they don't listen for you. It's like, it's so aggravating. It's so frustrating. It makes me want to sin sometimes. Uh, but th this thing where you're like, click, click, you know, you're turning on your listening ears. That really doesn't work. Um, that's just something. Don't even waste your time doing that because that's just something you're like, you think it's going to work and you do that and you realize it doesn't. You're like, it doesn't work. So you're just going to be more frustrated when you think something's going to work and it doesn't. But my kids, they don't listen. They're not going to listen all the time, every time. And we know that when they don't listen, they're just a bunch of sinners Right. And so uh, like that's what they are. They're little sinners running around your house, um, sinning all the time. Uh, but listen, listen, parents, this is your opportunity. This is I'm going to read a verse right here. And this is your chance to let out your biggest battle cry. Watching online, you shout it in your living room. Listen, this verse right here and, and students. You take notes on this one. Take notes on this one. Your parents want you to take notes right here. This is the first thing we see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, Children, do what your parents tell you. And all the parents in the house said, Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It says, this is only right. Do what your parents say. This is only right. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. That promise is, so you will live well and have a long life. What that means, live well, means that they're going to feed you. They're going to give you some clothes. They're going to give you a bed to sleep in. They're going to give you air conditioning and heat. And they're going to take care of you and pay for your cell phone and pay for your car and do these things. That's you living well. And so that you will have a long life, that means you're going to make it to adulthood. And you're going to hopefully get to do this with somebody. Uh, but that's what, that's what that promise is. Listen to your parents and do what they tell you because it's the... Uh, it's namely so it will go well with you and you will have a long life. Now, when Aniston was um, a, around four or five years old, uh, Aniston, she is, she's the oldest one, so she's the one right now that we have the most opportunities with. We don't have, we don't have problems with her. We have opportunities, a lot of opportunities there. Um, but she loves, I remember when I was first, when she was getting to the age and I was spanking her and she would say, that doesn't hurt. That didn't, that didn't hurt me. And I was like, if you don't get out of my sight, I am going to lose my mind in about three seconds. But 
But if you know Aniston, that's how Aniston is. She kind of pushes your buttons a little bit. Reminds me a little bit of her mother a little bit, but uh, <laughs> really it reminds me of me, which is, oh man. Uh, but I remember she was about four or five years old and kids have this ability um, uh, that when they're in trouble, um, they get really fast, they get really strong, and then when you finally catch them and you think you've got them, they get really slippery and they like slip away and they're like doing these moves and you just can't get a hold of them. Well, Aniston, she loves to like run her mouth a little bit and then she runs away and scurries around the corner or whatever it is. And um, so I remember one day she was, she was four or five and she was acting like a four or five year old. And um, so I finally got a hold of her. I finally uh, caught her and she was um, in our bedroom and she was on our bed. And I said, Aniston, I said, why can you not do what you're told to do? Why can't you just do what you're told to do? And no sooner had those words got out of my mouth that when the Holy Spirit uh, loosed the captive and uh, was, allowed her to go free because at that moment when I said, why can't you just do what you're told? I mean, it's, I mean we already saw this in Ephesians. Why, why can't you do it? And God spoke to me immediately as I'm trying to discipline my child. And he says, Harry, why can't you do what you're told? And I was like, oh, man, you know, I didn't think we were going to do this. Um, and so it got me thinking, like, you know, there's times when God tells me that I need to forgive somebody. There's times when I need to ask for forgiveness. There's times where I need to love somebody. There's times where I need to share my faith or pray more, whatever it is. And God said, why can't you just do what you're told? Harry, why can't you just do what you're told? It's simple, right? Why can't you do what you're told? I love what it says in Psalms, verse 32, uh, verses 8 and 9. Um, it says this, says, I hear the Lord saying, I will stay close to you, instructing and guiding you along the, on, along the pathway for your life. I will advise you along the way and lead you forth with my eyes as your guide. And it sounds a lot like what a parent wants to do for their children. They want to be close. They want to instruct. They want to guide. They want to advise you and, and, and lead their children. And so and that's what I want for my children. That's what I want to do. And, um, and we continue. It says, so don't make it difficult. Don't be stubborn when I take you where you've not been before. Don't let me tug you and pull you along. Just come with me. And as I'm trying to teach my children, I'm like, please, please don't make this any more difficult than it has to be. Just listen and do what you're told. And then I'm reminded that many times in my life, God has been pulling at me. Many times in my life, God has been tugging me and I'm fighting, I'm kicking and I'm screaming and I don't want to go. And I'm like, I don't want to trust you, God. I don't want to go somewhere where I've never been before. And I don't want you to take me. I want to do it my way in reality is what I'm saying. And so what I'm learning is no matter, no matter what God has done, and we can all say, yeah, God is good. We love God. He's been great to me. But a lot of times we just don't listen to what he says. If we're going to be honest. We don't listen to what God says and where he leads us. Um, so it doesn't matter, no matter what God has done for us, no matter what he's given us, kids aren't going to listen all the time, right? We're not going to listen all the time, every time. So that's one of the first lessons that my, my children are teaching me is kids, no matter what, kids aren't going to listen. And I know that I'm not going to listen all the time. And the second thing that uh, my kids are teaching me is no matter what, Kids are needy, right? No matter what, kids are needy. And kids, listen, they don't understand anything about convenience except that it's convenient for them. And you can say, well, don't bother me between the hours of 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. Or don't, you know, whatever, you know, you talk to me here. The kids are going to ask for something. They're going to want something. They're going to ask and just keep asking. And you know what kids do? They have this, they have this gift, to annoy you. Um, they have this gift and they're like asking over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm like, would you please just shut it 
enough. I don't. And this is what I tell my kids because I'm the number one dad in the world. This is what I tell my kids. I'm like, if you ask me this one more time, the answer is <laughs> no. The answer is no. I'm like, if you ask me that, one, if you ask me one more time, if you can have cereal for dinner, the answer is no. If you ask me one more time, if you can skip brushing your teeth, the answer is no. Stop bother me. I already heard you. I know what you want. Just leave me alone. I'll think about it. I'll get back with you. Um, but that's how, that's being a good dad. That's how I respond to my children. Don't, don't waste my time anymore. Um, which is kind of interesting because I say I love God and I follow Jesus. And you know, what's interesting about Jesus is a lot of times in his teachings, Jesus would, he would start off, he would say, you have heard it said, and you're like, yeah, we've heard that. And he says, but I tell you, and he goes on to tell us something different. And I'm like, well, that's really not what we thought, and that's not how we were raised. And that's kind of what, what Jesus is doing in this scripture right here in Luke chapter 18. I'm going to read eight verses with you, so, so hang tight in there. But Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's teaching his followers. Um, and then right in the onset, he tells us what this is about. Verse 1 says, one day... Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So this story that Jesus is about to share is like, hey, this is about prayer, okay? This is about asking for things. And he goes on to say in verse 2, there was a judge in a certain city. This judge neither feared God, nor he didn't care about people. A widow from that city came to him repeatedly. She came over and over and over again saying to the judge, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God, I don't care about people, I don't care about this widow, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant Request Any parents ever get worn out with the constant, repeated request from your children? He says, Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry, cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Verse 8, and I love this. I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have such faith? You know, kids, they're needy. And when they need something, they're going to ask you over and over and over again until you give it to them or until you lose your mind. Now, What's different here is Jesus, he said, I'm telling him, you ask me that one more time, the answer is no, because I'm a good dad, and that's how I respond to my kids. But Jesus is saying, how many people, when the Son of Man returns, how many people am I going to find that have the faith, the faith to persevere, to keep asking over and over and over again. You know, I think it's easy for us, you know, it's easy for us to maybe jot something down in our prayer journal. It's easy for us to, to pray for something one time. And maybe it's even a little easy for us to pray for something two times or a second day, maybe even a third day. Uh, but things get a little more difficult when the days begin to turn into weeks and we're still praying. And the weeks turn into months. You still don't have your answer you're looking for. The months turn into years. You know, Jesse's sitting right down front here with us, our student director, and she has been praying for her family for years. It's so easy for us to pray maybe once or twice. It gets a little more difficult when we're not seeing God move or we don't see God move in the way we want him to move. And God's saying, man, when I come back, am I going to find people that have the persistent faith to cry to me, day and night, night and day, over and over and over again. And so that's what I'm learning from my children. 
that no matter how big or small the request is, when they need something, they're coming to their father. They're coming to their father with a request and they're going to continue asking me. They don't care what time of day it is. They don't care if I'm busy, if I'm stressed, I'm tired. They're going to ask me over and over again. And this is what I'm learning that God really, he loves it when we bring our request to him. He loves it when we stop what we're doing and we pray and we call out to God. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And God just wants us to to delight in him and give him our request. That's what he wants. He wants us to pray and ask him over and over. And God's not gonna respond like this old guy and say, you ask me that one more time, the answer is no. God, I believe, loves it when he hears us, when he sees us pleading, when he sees the tears, when he sees the heartache for us to continue to be faithful and persistent even when we haven't gotten that answer yet. No matter how much we, we teach our kids to be self-sufficient, you know, hey, you're, you're big enough where you can, you know, make your own plate, or you're big enough where you can fix your own drink or, you know, wash your own clothes or whatever. We try to teach these uh, things where our children can grow up and be independent. Um, no matter what, kids are going to be needy. There's going to be things that I need sometimes, and, and I have, an earth, uh, he- have a heavenly Father that delights in me making requests to Him. So no matter what we've seen, no matter what, our kids are going to not listen. They're not going to listen all the time, every time. I'm not going to listen all the time, every time. And kids are always going to be needy, right? And no matter what, the third thing we see is that kids are messy, Oh my goodness, kids are messy. No matter how often you clean, no matter when you clean, no matter when you get your toys put away, no matter when you get your garage straightened up, no matter when you bring all the toys in from out of the yard and you put them up, uh, no matter what, things are going to get messy and we can get frustrated about it. And no matter, you know, no matter what happens, we're like, why, why are you playing with those toys? And our kids are just looking at us confused like, what? well, why do we have these toys? Didn't you get us these magnets? Didn't you get us these uh, markers? Markers are of the devil. Don't get they don't don't ever buy markers. You know those are those things are bad. Um, but they're like w- w- you know we're we're just using what you've given us. So we've kind of created this little problem with these magnets, and they're wanting to play. And we're like we just put those toys away uh, earlier today. You can't bring them out now. Well, why not? I thought you, know, you should be lucky that you even have toys. Don't be so ungrateful thinking you're going to get to play with them too. Don't be thinking, that's, that's crazy talk. That is crazy talk. So, you know, our kids are messy. Uh, I remember this one time. Uh, I stayed home with our two girls unsupervised by myself. And uh, I, I honestly, I wasn't feeling well. Um, I wasn't feeling too bad. I was just feeling a little under the weather. And Kristen was off at work or she was gone and it was kind of it was before noon so my kids were there and um i uh i decided that i was going to sit in my recliner and pray for about 45 minutes and you know with my eyes closed without saying any words um but so i kicked back in my recliner kicked the feet up and um and i fall asleep and about 40, this was about from 10 a.m. to 10.45. Um, and I wake up to hear this sound uh, in the kitchen. And I'm like, what? what is going on? So I get up out of the chair. I walk into the kitchen. And there I find my two daughters standing on the counters. You know, they're standing, you know, on the countertop with the microwave going with something in the microwave that is smoking. And I'm like, what? what is in there? Like, is there like aluminum foil or something in there? What's going on? So I'm like, and there, Parker had on this white t-shirt that was just, looked like she had been in the mud. I mean, it was just covered. I'm like, what? I'm like, girls, what are you guys doing? Come on, let's, let's get down from here. I was like, what's, what are you guys doing? And my girls love making s'mores. 
Um, so we have like marshmallows and graham crackers and little chocolate bars at the house all the time. That's all they ever want to do is make s'mores. And uh, so we, we buy those little, the little mini bars or snack bars or whatever they're called. And so it looked like my girls had opened a thousand of those and just threw the wrappers wherever they may. And they had this chocolate in a dish in the microwave that was smoking. And I'm like, how long have you had this in here? Like, what is going on? And they were just looking at me so proud. They had these big smiles on their face. And they were just looking back at me like, Look, we, we've done a good thing. And I'm like, what are, what are you even doing? Like, we're making edible slime. We're going to make some edible slime. And I was like, oh, my goodness. No, we can't do this. We got to get this cleaned up quick before mommy comes home, right? And so... As the more that I'm exploring, I see that the mess wasn't limited to the microwave. And I go to the door leading out to the backyard and I see glitter and finger paints and things smeared all over the kitchen floor and all over the door leading to the backyard. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm getting a little frustrated. And I'm like, y'all better hope this comes up off this floor. Because I didn't know what, I didn't know if it was like they went to the hardware store and bought a gallon of paint, threw it down or what. There's no telling what happened. And so I'm like, y'all better hope I, we get all this cleaned up. Not only do we got to get it cleaned up, we got to get it cleaned up quick. Um, so then I continue to explore, to check out, to assess the situation, see what other damage is done. And I go into the dining room and I find a, you know, it's about 1045 in the morning. I find a tub of Briar's vanilla ice cream out on the kitchen table. I find Hershey's syrup. I find whipped cream, sprinkles, cherries, a waffle bowls, like waffle cone bowls. And like ice cream melted everywhere. I'm like, what in the world? What are you guys doing? And and they were so proud. They said, well, we wanted to be, we knew you were asleep and we want to be very quiet so we didn't wake you up. I'm like, good job. You did a really, really good job there because old dad didn't wake up when all this, when the, when the microwave's burning and, you know, smoke's billowing through the house and glitters everywhere. And I'm like, oh my goodness. But they had made such a mess that it was, a, it was one of those messes where, you know, normally good parents were like, you made that mess, you're cleaning that up, right? That's what, that's what we do. Number one, dads do that. You made that mess, you're going to clean it up. This mess was so big that um, I needed to help them. I needed to help them clean up. And uh, there's this guy in the Bible named David. And David was a pretty cool guy in the Bible. Um, God did some really uh, neat things in and through his life. Uh, he was one of the kings of Israel. Uh, scripture refers to David as a man after God's own heart. Um, well, David uh, also had some messes in his life. And uh, one time David uh, uh, sees this woman and uh, inquires of who this lady is. And um, they tell him who she is. And he says, well, I, I want her. And um, David ends up having sex with this woman who was married, married to a guy that was in his army. So that's a mess. It's a little bit of a mess there. Well, then she ends up pregnant. So now it's getting a little even messier. Well, then, so David said, well, I got to, you know, when we make a mess, we try to clean it up. That's what we try to do. We try to clean it up. So David tries to clean up his own mess with some smoke and mirrors and tries to get Uriah, the lady's husband, to do some things. And Uriah's like, man, my, my, my army is out of battle right now. You want me to be at home? I can't do this. And so Uriah goes back out to the battlefield and things are still getting messier and messier. And David's like, oh, I've got to clean this up somehow. And so David essentially has this man murdered. Um, he says, we want Uriah to go out on the front lines and just leave him there by himself. He's going to be killed in battle. He had him murdered. One of his own men. He had him murdered because he had made his life a mess. It got really messy really quickly in David's life. But David had a guy named Nathan that came to him 
and we're sharing with him. And, and, and this guy, Nathan, basically called David out on his sin. And when David realized the mess that he had made, you know, sometimes in the mess, we can't really see straight. All we see is the mess. We don't know a way out. Well, Nathan tells David, this is what's happened. And David becomes heartbroken over the mess in his life. And in Psalm 51, verse 2, David says this. He says, Thoroughly wash me inside and out of all my crooked deeds. Cleanse me from my sins. Cleanse me of my wickedness with hyssop. I will be clean. And David says, If you wash me, I will be whiter than snow. David knew that his life was out of control. His life was a mess. And then I love this in verse 10, what David says. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore within me a sense of being brand new. I love that verse because I love what David says but I also love what he doesn't say. He says, create me a clean heart. David didn't ask for a new heart. Oh man, he didn't ask for a new heart. He asked for a clean heart. You know, sometimes in life we make a mess. We just get a little dirty. We don't need a new heart. We need our dad to come clean up the mess that we made. And this is what David's doing. He says, Create in me a clean heart, not a new heart, a clean heart. He got a little dirty, got a little messy, and I love that. And this is what I'm learning. I'm learning uh, that God loves us without conditions. And when Aniston was about three, four, five, six months old, I began speaking a promise over Aniston's life, and I've, I've kind of used this as a guide in other areas of my life, and I've used it for all of our children. But when she was about four, five, six months old, they're so little, they, don't, they can't even talk back to you. You just kind of tote them around in the little carrier. And um, But I just looked at Aniston, and I said, Aniston, Daddy loves you no matter what. No matter what. I love you. No matter what you do, and she's, you know, little, and she's just staring back at me. And it's no matter... When you don't listen, I love you. Whenever you're needy, I love you. Whenever you make your life messy and dirty, I love you no matter what. And that's what I'm learning about God, that he loves you and that he loves me no matter what. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter where we've been, he loves us no matter what. Romans 5, 18 through 20 says this. So here's the result. As one man's sin brought about condemnation and punishment for all people, so one man's act of faithfulness makes all of us right with God and brings us to new life. He's talking about Adam. Through Adam, we're all sinners. Through Christ, we have an opportunity at life. Just as through one man's defiant disobedience, every one of us were made sinners, so through the willing obedience of one man, many of us will be made right. Verse 20 is, in my opinion, just a beautiful picture of God saying, I love you no matter what, no matter what. Verse 20, and when the law came in to the picture, Sin grew and grew. You know, the law was given for us, not for us to keep it, right? The law was given not for us to keep it, but to show us that we needed someone to help us, to show us that we, need, that we can't do this on our own. Sin grew and grew, but wherever sin grew and spread, God's grace was there in fuller, greater measure, no matter how much sin crept in. 
there was always more grace. No matter what sin you've committed, no matter what you've done, there's always more grace because God loves you no matter what. No matter when we're needy, when we don't listen, when we are messy, when we feel guilty, when we feel unworthy, when we feel unlovable, God loves you no matter what. I'm going to invite you all to stand to your feet as we pray. Somebody here, I believe, needs to know that no matter what, God loves you. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God loves you. And there's nothing that you can do to change that love. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for loving us in our mess. Thank you that when we make a mess that is too big for us, you are always willing, waiting, and ready to clean up our mess. Thank you for loving us no matter what. In Christ's name, amen. What's up, online family? Man, it is so good to see you. And it really is the honor of my life to be able to bring these messages to you each week. I really hope that they're a blessing to you, and that you're enjoying them. Uh, we really do consider you family. So it's an honor uh, for us that you would take time out of your day to tune in with us and connect with us. We really are one church in many different locations. I wanna ask you to do uh, some small things that make a big impact. One is, would you share this message? If it blessed you, if it spoke to you, share it on your social media platforms. Also, another small thing is to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, these make a big impact and help us bring these messages forth really to our nation and to the world. I also wanna say thank you to those that give financially and tithe. Uh, you're the reason that we're able to even bring this content forward and be able to get the message out. And so I just wanna say thank you to you. And if you wanna partner with us financially, uh, man, we would be honored by that. We'd be blessed by it, I know you would be. And you can actually give through the app or you can give online. And again, uh, it would just be our honor uh, to partner with you in that way. Hey, we love you, online family. I hope that you will join us back next week as we continue in this series.